Somewhere in China, around 200 BC, some guy was, let's just say, out in a field somewhere. Maybe he was a farmer, maybe he was a miner or something. But anyway, he finds a rock that's fairly long, elongated rock. And for whatever reason, he ties it to a string. Maybe he was making a toy out of it. Maybe he was making some kind of weapon. But for whatever reason that he did this, he found that when he was dangling this rock by the string, it always found a way of pointing in the same direction. The rock, of course, was a magnetic lodestone, and this was the world's first compass. Except they didn't actually use it for navigating. This was the age of spirits and demons and gods, so this was actually used for divination and feng shui and that kind of thing. They called it a south pointer, I guess, because they were more interested in it in the south direction than the north direction. But to their credit, the Chinese were the first to use this for navigation about a thousand years later, around 1000 AD, and then it took another couple of years for it to spread into Europe and the Middle East. This, of course, opened up the seas and opened up trade routes and helped us to navigate the world better than we'd ever done it before, but we still never really understood how it worked. It was William Gilbert of England that first theorized that it works because the world acts like a magnet in his book on the magnet, magnetic bodies, and the great magnet of the Earth. Though he still didn't quite understand how it worked. Earlier theories guessed that the entire planet was just made out of magnetic rock, but the problem is that the deeper you go down and the hotter the rocks get, the more they kind of lose their magnetism. So it was Joseph Larmer in 1919 that was the first person to propose that maybe we have some kind of self-sustaining dynamo inside the planet that's creating and generating this magnetic field. And Larmer's theory was proven true in the 1940s by Walter L. Saucer and uh, Edward Bullard when they came up with the dynamo theory of magnetism, which actually put all this into numbers and made it all make sense scientifically and whatnot. Because at this point, we had a better understanding of the inside of our Earth, and we already knew that we had a solid iron nickel core at the center of our Earth, about the size of the moon, and then we had an outer core about the size of Mars that was liquid metal. And the dynamo theory suggests that while the outer core rotates around the inner core, Coriolis effect takes over and creates convection currents that generate this magnetic field. At the same time, we were learning just how important this magnetic field is in terms of protecting the Earth from the deadliest of the sun's radiation and, and keeping life you know, safe and protected down here on the surface. And we also learned that it has a tendency to flip sometimes. And that it may be doing it again soon. In the long list of weird coincidences that made life on this planet possible, one of the things that has to be right up at the very top is the strong magnetic field that protects us from the sun. I actually just talked about this on Monday. Of the four rocky planets in our solar system, the Earth is the only one that has a strong magnetic field. The other three all have no magnetic field in common. Something else they all have in common? No life. And they also don't have technology. Technology that we have our whole infrastructure, our whole lives built around right now, it's actually heavily reliant on the magnetic field. So in some ways, we need our magnetic field more now than we ever have before. Right now, we have satellites swarming all around the Earth, providing communication and navigation and whatnot. All of those have delicate components that could be fried without a magnetic field to protect them. Now, of course, if we lost all of our GPS satellites, which is kind of like saying ATM machine, um, there's always compasses to fall back on for navigation. But the problem with that is that the magnetic North Pole is moving a lot. Now, we've known since the 1800s that the true north and magnetic north have always been off by a little bit. The magnetic north has always been closer to the Canadian Arctic. And we've known that the pole has a tendency to drift, which is why the NOAA has always released their world magnetic model every five years so that we can keep track of where this thing is moving around. This makes sure that shipping services and military organizations have an accurate model for their navigation purposes. But beginning in the mid-1990s, it started moving a lot faster. It went from moving about 9 miles per year to about 34 miles per year. And just last year in 2018, the pole actually crossed over the international date line into the eastern hemisphere. Now ironically, this shift has actually moved the magnetic pole closer to the true North Pole, but it's been moving so fast that the NOAA had to release their magnetic model a year early. Like, it's not supposed to go out until next year. They went ahead and did it this year because it's been moving that much that it's causing that much of a problem. So why the sudden movement? Scientists aren't sure. One theory is that there's a high-speed jet of liquid iron underneath the surface of Canada that's scooting everything over towards Siberia. Scooting. But is this cause for alarm outside of navigational issues, you know? Is this, is this indicative that there's something actually wrong going on down there? Is it time to panic? That's a joke, of course. It's always time to panic. I should rename this channel Existential Dread with Joe. Look, this might not mean anything. It might just be some movement in the outer core that's causing an accelerated drift, that's all. <laughs> but it could also mean the poles are about to flip and cause global chaos. Because the magnetic field has flipped in the past. 
Like, a lot. Like, once every 500,000 years or so. We know this because of magnetic lines we found in lava at the bottom of the ocean, because as the lava comes out through those fissures in the tectonic plates, it cools and the ferrous metals kind of line up with the magnetic field. So you can pull that apart, take a look at it, see which direction they're pointing, and see which direction the magnetic field was pointing itself. And through this method, scientists know that the pole hasn't flipped in around 750,000 years, so we're long overdue for a good old switcheroo. Now it's thought this happens because those convection currents in the outer core are just a little bit unstable and every once in a while the little vortex can spin off here and there, cause it to become even more unstable, it goes into a little bit of a chaotic state before it reorients itself and finds stability again. It's just good old fluid dynamics. And if there is a stray iron current going underneath Canada pushing the North Pole towards Siberia, it could be part of that instability that could be, be the beginning of this thing starting to flip. So, panic? Not yet. When we talk about flip, we're actually talking about over geologic time, so it's not like you would just wake up tomorrow and up is down, left is right, cats are dogs, you know, this would take several thousand years. Like, if the pole started flipping when Socrates was alive, it would just now be finishing, so there's time to adjust. Now, that doesn't mean this is without its dangers. An unstable magnetic field would probably be severely weakened, meaning more radiation from the sun would come through, meaning more potential for, for cancers and genetic defects. The good news, though, is that there hasn't been any real correlation between magnetic pole flips and mass extinctions that we've found, so it's possible that it won't actually uh, affect us as much as we think it might although there's still research going on in this department. What might be more profound is, like I was talking about before, the effect it would have on our satellites and possibly our energy grids. It could leave us much more vulnerable to coronal mass ejection events like the Carrington event that could actually shut down our electrical grids. So there's a couple of ways this could go down. One is that it just might get a little bit more chaotic and more chaotic over the next thousands of years until eventually everything just kind of reorients itself and it flips into that uh, opposite direction. Or the other possibility might be just that the pole moves slowly and meanders across the surface of the Earth until it eventually gets to the other side, meaning we could possibly see the North Pole somewhere in Africa at some point. The fact of the matter is the pole may have been in the process of flipping since the very beginning of human civilization. We just don't know any better. As humans, we have such a limited perspective of time. When we look at these long-term geologic processes, it's kind of like we just get a snapshot of it and then try to put together the entire story. It'd be like pulling a frame out of a two-hour movie and then trying to piece together the entire plot. So even though we've actually mapped the magnetic field to extreme accuracy, especially thanks to the ESA swarm mission, uh, we don't know if this is normal or if this is an aberration, or is there even any such thing as normal? Time will tell, and we've got plenty of it, so no need to panic. Or at least, don't panic about this. Global warming will kill us all long before this does. <laughs> Tell me what you think. Do you think this is going to be a big deal? Do you think we're actually in the middle of a flip? Do you think that it could take thousands of years? Do you think that it could just reorient itself? Or if it could just travel and you might go to the North Pole and in the Mount Kilimanjaro someday? Talk about it in the comments. T-shirts available in the store, answerswithjoe.com slash shirts. Show the world your dynamo and they will love you for it. <laughs> what does that mean? I don't know. Go to answerswithjoe.com slash shirts. I uh, almost got it. Thanks so much for watching. If this is your first time here, uh, Google thinks you'll like that video, so you might want to watch it because Google will get mad if you don't. And uh, if you do like that one, there's other videos down here. I suggest you go check them out. And if you like those, please do subscribe. Come back with videos just like this every Thursday and every Monday. All right, that's it for now. You guys go out, have an eye-opening rest of the week, and I'll catch you on Monday. Love you guys. Take care.